The, the, the role of a color grader is changing and it's starting to morph or open up to almost a second stream into something like a finishing artist. In that um, not only do you just change the color of things, you're, you're manipulating the visual effects and then you're, you're building timelines so that they can then be fed into the, the deliverables um, factory almost. And that skill set at the moment is really being learnt as we go. In the, in the old days of a film lab, there used to be a system with apprentice and you would work with a colour timer and th there would be quite a, a kind of work stream. Um, because technology now is moving so fast and there is a lot of technology and there's a lot of being asked of people to understand both technology but to also have an understanding of aesthetics, of, of lighting and so forth. So to, to that extent, Technicolor is really looking at the future and we're also working at just trying to sort of formulate the roles We now have a situation that's almost become a second industry and a second skill set. And this has happened in the space of maybe five years where we've gone from a single point of display, a 14 foot Lambert widescreen Xenon, through to what is now typically nine different formats. And those formats are different both in color space, light level and the physical medium that it is displayed on or with. It is now expected to produce a grade that works on a white screen, a silver screen, an HDR at 4000, an HDR uh, monitor at 1000, and then the leg what, what is now called the, the legacy format, say at, at 709. That's put enormous pressure on colorists, both in terms of skill sets, um, but it, it's also raised a, 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 a kind of agonizing question that becomes quite philosophical. And that is, does one perform a true and accurate representation of their master grade to work on all these varying distribution uh, mediums? Or does one embrace the characteristics of each of those mediums and find story points or, or, or some kind of aesthetic uh, cues that ideally um, enhance and embrace um, the, the storyline. Th that core philosophical uh, question is, is perhaps the most agonizing part of, at least for me, uh, in terms of color grading. To build a timeline and a grade that works in all these varying color spaces and varying light levels, uh, I really need some software or some, some grades that, that doesn't compress, clip, or impart any kind of look in itself onto the grade. For, for that reason, I tend to go with uh, film light technology because it, it's really quite transparent. And I think the, the key word here is agnostic because if one agrees to produce a grade on, uh, say, the major distribution medium, which would be 2D Xenon widescreen, uh, you, you need a set of tools that can embrace the, you know, the, 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 the filmmaker's uh, intent. Knowing that that will then be displayed on all these other mediums, we then need to really wrangle that imagery. And to do that, we then call on a lot of color science. We're currently sitting in front of a Dolby Pulsar 4000 nit HDR monitor. I'm using a base light, but the, the actual hardware and assets are actually back at uh, Technicolor at Lexington Street. We are at Dolby over in Soho. We're using a, a base light host that's connected by a high speed dark fiber link back to Lexington. And I can still use my controls and have uh, real time on this monitor. A consideration of HDR is not just the light levels and the calibration of the monitor, it's also the ambient light level of the room itself. There's just a sheer physical amount of light that flare is now a consideration in that uh, the brighter the image, 
the brighter the room becomes. So to emulate that, there's quite a few tools that, that I've had built within the base light to really um, tailor the flare and the tone mapping of an image as it moves through the different display mediums. Another set of deliverables that's becoming very common is a Dolby Vision grade, which is 108 nits on 2D white screen and 48 nits 3D white screen. These are laser projectors, uh, which give a significantly increased contrast range. And we'll notice also the environment itself has an increased uh, contrast range, one of which is to cut down on flare. So we'll see the entire room is really a black box. So what we've done, is, at least at Technicolor, is that we use the same package for both the conforming, for the grading, for the rendering of the distribution mediums. It's really like the main tool set um, for the building. Then we wrap around that some industry standard uh, color spaces that allows us to exchange visual effects between the, the anything up to 20 or 30 visual effects facilities. And uh, say there was a, a point about three months ago where I had up to 17,000 visual effects pools um, spread throughout the world. So to avoid complete anarchy, we need to lock down on a, a standard file, which, which uh, we prefer EXR, and then a standard color space, which is ACES Linear. And they're distributed through the various facilities. Knowing that Filmlight is active with both the ACES uh, committee and has adhered to industry practice, we know that these files are um, up to industry spec. Likewise, by choosing a, a industry agreed file format and color space, it makes it easy for all the visual effects facility to deliver back to us uh, correct files. By bringing all these files under the one timeline and then also ac accessing raw and using the same debayering and transforms and everything else, we have an absolute purity to the image. So, Having achieved this zen-like space of um, an industry known and industry agreed color space and file format, I can bring all those imagery uh, ready to color grade. But because of the kind of work I, I do, I need a ultra wide gamut color space that is known to be wider than any of the display mediums. I am able to grade and use all the varying tools and one of the advantages within the film light is that I can access custom color spaces and, and varying operations. I'm then able to tap into Technicolor Color Science to get this timeline into the varying display transforms, basically proprietary display transforms. Um, that's because, at least for me, I consider a DRT is intrinsic to the color grade and a, a display transform or a show LUT in the old language is a personal choice and it contains all the, the, the aesthetic choices and is married to that grade. The impact of multiple deliveries on look development is now a changing trend. To successfully do that, that's really marrying quite a lot of um, color science, um, aesthetics, uh, grading skills, and, and an understanding of, of display mediums. So to do that, I tend to lean on base light technology for the grading components. Uh, the tool sets are known. Uh, they work in extremely high quality. So the, the tool sets themselves are, are quite agnostic. And the, the, there's quite a kind of Meccano set-like mentality to the software that is fantastic because it means it can be tailored to each project and frankly each uh, person using it because each person tends to go about it in a different way. And it, it really raises the question of when you are designing the look of a film, you are designing the look of the film for what medium? Which again gets back to the, the need to, to really have a philosophical commitment 
at the beginning when you are building a film's look and, and uh, working with the DP and, and the director, basically the, the creative team, is this look to be faithfully reproduced or are there considerations and, and beats that can be incorporated into the lighting and the script to enhance or to embrace the different mediums? The classic is you know, the 3D moment and uh, something that, that's really started to happen I in the most recent films is really the HDR moment. An artifact of the move away from 35mm negative and distribution on 35mm print has been to an extent almost an erasure of the DP's signature. A DP would reach for those tools uh, and just simply by how a DP would expose and light for a film negative would give a, a specific look and, and a unique look, their signature. In, in the striving for technical perfection and absolute standards, a digital camera tends to look the same no matter who uses it. So the camera itself is agnostic. The way a DP used to have a film lab develop their negative would impart their signature and their look. A bleach bypass, a skip bypass, a double print, uh, a cross process, all these things were, were quite radical and quite, uh, would impart quite a look. Again, with software, we're achieving this state of absolute agnostic, so you debayer and it will look the same. In fact, that's the ideal. That allows then the DI or the grade to return the DP signature back. It, it's that kind of physicality that at least for me is the, the most interesting part of look development and grading, which is to try and bring a sense of physicality back to the image. Because if you just have a CMOS in whatever camera, ARRI, Alexa, you know, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very kind of raw, no pun intended, look to the, the, the image. So by using color grading to, to try and impart a physicality to the image, that means I'm reaching for not only changes in color, but changes in the MTF, changes in the flare, I'm really trying to emulate interlayer effects. There's all sorts of uh, spatial and temporal operations that, that we bring to a color grade. Likewise, when we then reproduce this grade on the different mediums, each medium has its own MTF, its, its own contrast ratio, and, and most important for me is its own flare which means that each display device is quite reactive to the image. So for me, when I move a grade from one medium to the other, one of the things that I, I'm really trying to do is control and reproduce somehow both the MTF and the flare so that it kind of feels the same across the different mediums. And I have been finding that it's actually that is perhaps the, the, the key component because the, the color science is known and uh, the transforms are known. And if we do this, you know, combining Technicolor transforms and, and DRTs with, with the baseline implementation in these huge cubes and, and um, GPU based um, shaders, uh, the, the color accuracy is extremely good. color spaces as a grading tool. If we take, for example, the deep blue dress of Eva Green in Miss Peregrine, working in a classic, even Acer CC, the, the deep blue was such that the normal RGB-based tools didn't really give me the accuracy to um, fine tune it. So I turned to uh, Richard and, and the Filmlight team to build me a LAB space, 
which allowed me to work exclusively in that really deep, deeply saturated but extremely low luminance level region of a shot. I could manipulate, find the blue to be just so, and then convert back in, and then we're all kind of off and running. So it, it's the idea of using color spaces as a grading tool. Uh, and because it's all in float point and, and uh, they're very large grading spaces, uh, the color, color accuracy is extremely good. It was the same concept if we look at um, Fantastic Beasts where the color palette was to be reminiscent of a 1940s, you know, New York vintage kind of film, you know, without making it sepia. Um, so we had a, a lot of very pale faces. It was to be New York in winter, but it, it was not to be dour or depressing. It was to be kind of very um, sparkly and alive. So for that, I kept the film in Asus CC, but in terms of the debayering, uh, Philippe Rousselot, the DP, was using Alexa, but I bypassed ARRI wide gamut completely. And what that gave me was um, more a, a wider range or, or an ability to really work around the magentas and the greens. So it, it meant that I, I could really set the skin tone to be just so. In my role as a supervising colorist, I will come on board um, pretty much with the DP at the beginning of a shoot, where uh, the DP and production designer will start to design the look of the film. The DP will, will start to work out their lighting package and, and the overall um, look of a film. The decisions that are made when a DP starts a shoot is based on a certain LUT and a certain contrast range and a certain color space. The delivery of that film may not happen until two or even three years later. So it's essential that the software that the film was shot for or that the rushes was used is consistent. So the stability of a company and the stability of their software is intrinsic because the last thing you want to do is start a project with some software and then have to finish it with some other software. And, and, that's, and that, that all comes under the, the word of archiving. So one thing I've been extremely appreciative of Filmlight software, and it, whilst it may sound very simplistic, it's really solid code. And the legacy aspect of this is extremely important because whilst it's great to have updates and iterations of software, we're still needing to use the same build and the same tool set that we started a film with because that's how the film was lit. So the, the film like database concept uh, is a godsend. There's the color grading, there's the deliverables, but there is now this third aspect of it, which is archiving. Because it used to be you would just archive the 35 mil neg. Now it's what do you in fact archive? And again, it's another commitment that needs to be made, which is what are you archiving? Just the assets or the actual creative decisions, or in other language, the metadata. So to archive the metadata, I tend to reach for film light technology because I'm able to recall grades that I've done in 2005 and it still works. Archiving in itself is now an interesting question and it's starting to settle into um, what file format to use and what color space and it's still a little contentious but it's starting to settle into the idea of archive the, the raw media and then archive to a wide gamut, wide bit depth file and color space, typically a 16-bit EXR non-compressed ASUS linear. 
There are some studios that prefer a P3 archive, but the concept is to archive off a graded timeline with no DRT, and then to archive off the timeline with the DRT, and then from that go out to the various display mediums.